for Jacob's seed to spread across the whole world. Over the past few thousand years, only one race in history has truly spread across the entire world, populating every continent to every corner, covering the whole earth completely, that being the one and only European people. So if Yahweh made prophecies that the Israelites would one day do this, and if only one people in history have actually ever accomplished this, well how can anybody else be the Israelites? The prophecies begin in Genesis with promises to Abraham which are passed down to his son Isaac and then to his grandson Jacob. That Jacob's seed, the 12 tribes, would spread everywhere. The Israelites were never supposed to be limited to just the lands of Canaan. Yahweh had bigger plans for us right from the beginning. But these weren't the only prophecies. After the Exodus, Moses, just before his death, gave further blessings upon the children of Israel. He prophesied that Joseph one day would push all the Israelites to the ends of the earth. So in other words, one tribe in particular would largely be responsible for facilitating and aiding all of the Israelites encompassing the whole world. And by the time of the prophet Isaiah, who was speaking at the time of the Assyrian deportations, even then in one of our darkest hours, he still made a bold prophecy that one day in the future, Jacob, the children of Israel, would fill the the world with fruit, showing that all those Genesis prophecies would still be fulfilled, and that fruit must be Christianity. Looking at maps only over a century ago, you can clearly see the prophecy was fulfilled in the European colonization period. Our people really have spread everywhere. And what is also amazing is just as Moses promised to us over 3,000 years ago, one tribe rose up amongst the Europeans. A small island was largely responsible. The British Empire, which for a time ruled all the seas, really did help push the Europeans to the ends of the earth. So to try and claim that any other people are the children of Israel is to deny scripture and simply mock reality. Now we've shown that the Germanic tribes came from the Israelites, but they weren't the only ones. In fact, many of the Greeks, the Romans, and many more were Israelites as well, and it's about time our people fully understood our full history of our people. It all began with the Exodus, where Moses led the children of Israel, our ancestors, out of Egypt. But it may come as a surprise to hear that no Israelites followed Moses into the wilderness, that many instead stuck out for Europe on ships. Unfortunately, most of our people today are completely unaware of this because our people are no longer taught proper history in school anymore. In the early Greek classical literature, the historian Theodorus Siculus mentions a Moses leading his people out of Egypt into a region called Judea. This shows that there are in fact records of the 12 tribes even in the Greek classics. He goes on to say that Moses was very wise, that he split the Israelites into 12 tribes and that they built Jerusalem. But what he also says is that a vast number instead of following Moses rallied together and sailed for Greece. So many of the Greeks later on would be descended from the Israelites. Even even if they wouldn't have realized it. He says that they were led by two notable men, Danaeus and Cadmus. Now this is the beginning of the prophecy that all Adamic nations would gradually be replaced by Israelites. The promises to Abraham that his seed, his physical seed, not spiritual, his descendants would inherit all the nations. The Israelites who reached the shores of Greece are generally known as the Danoi or Danan Greeks, which indicates that they were primarily Israelites from the tribe of Dan. Now Greece wasn't completely uninhabited, there were other people already there. Those people for the most part were called the Ionian Greeks, which sometimes is also translated as Yavanna, since they were descended from Javan, the son of Japheth, the son of Noah. The Danans initially settled in Achaia, the northern part of the southern Peloponnesus Peninsula of Greece. But their two greatest cities became Mycenae and Argos. So for this reason, Danans also got called Archaeans, Mycenaeans, and Argives. They're all the same people. No doubt you've heard historians mention the Mycenaean Greek culture, it rings a bell. But what they don't tell you is that they were Danan Greeks and that they came from the Exodus. This brings us back to Danaeus, the Egyptian, said to be the founder and leader of the Danans, who was the son of Abelus, a great pharaoh. 
Now no doubt the truth got mixed up a bit and this is really based on the patriarch Dan and his mother Belilah. The humble beginning became a bit grander and they got carried away. So the Danans included Achilles, Odysseus, Agamemnon, Helen of Troy who are all described as fair, many having blonde and red hair just like any European today. So if the Danans look like that, what would the other Israelites who went with Moses have looked like? Surely just the same. Now as for the other leader Cadmus, he is said to have founded the city of Thebes which became a Phoenician colony and this is probably why he is called Cadmus the Phoenician. The important thing to realise is that Cadmus was an Israelite and so were the Phoenicians which we will explain a little bit later. Thebes was located close to Athens on the right hand side of Greece and it's most famous for rebellion against Sparta and winning a series of great victories over them which put an end to Spartan dominance over Greece. Cadmus is said to be the one who introduced the Hebrew Phoenician alphabet which became the common alphabet all throughout Greece and eventually coined Greek became the common language which even the New Testament is written in. So prior to Cadmus, the Greeks i.e. those Ionians had been using an Egyptian type script, no doubt influenced by the power and influence of the Egyptian Empire but now it would be replaced with the Israelite Phoenician alphabet. So when we think about it, the Phoenician alphabet was adapted to make the Greek alphabet which in turn the Romans adapted to make their Latin alphabet which in turn was later adapted by all Europeans to form their own languages. So in other words, Phoenician is Hebrew and therefore we are using the same alphabet of our Israelite ancestors even today it has merely evolved into different forms over the thousands of years. Now we're on to the legendary Troy and the Trojans. They were another great civilization that seemed to have sprung up from nowhere just after the exodus because they were amongst the Israelites who spread into Europe. But we should first discuss the blessings Jacob gave on his deathbed to his 12 sons and amongst these blessings Judah inherited the birthright of being the kingly tribe that in fact there would always be a ruler for all time forever from his descendants. Well we have a problem there. If we work out a rough timeline of the exodus, the first kings and from there around when Jacob died, what well, it's well over 600 years from the prophecy to King David. So what happened there? Was the prophecy wrong? The answer is that Judah had twin sons Zara and Pharez. During the birth Zara's hand came out first and a scarlet thread was placed over it. Hmm, a bloody hand with a scarlet thread, where have I seen that symbol before? But anyways, this hand went back in and then Pharaz was born first. So evidently Pharaz received the birthright and from Pharaz we get King David. So Pharaz's line ruled over the kingdom of Israel. But what about Zara's line? Well Zara's sons are listed in the Bible and amongst them are Zimri, Ethan, Heman, Kalkol and Dada. This brings us back to Troy. Its origins come from a Dardanus who appeared in the Troad which is West Turkey today and founded a new colony, a kingdom which he named Dardania after himself and his people were called the Dardanians. Back to Zara, whilst his sons are listed in the Bible, when Jacob and his sons travelled to Egypt to join Joseph, Zara came with them but his sons did not, they just disappear. Furthermore, any grandsons or later descendants are never mentioned. So how does this lead to Troy? Well Dada's grandson Tros founded a new city, Troy, which he named after himself and his people got called the Trojans. Troy eventually eclipsed Dardania in fame and wealth. So this means that both Dardanians and Trojans and any later descendants would have been from the tribe of Judah through Zara. So now we can begin to understand the significance of why King Solomon was compared to Dada in wisdom. Solomon, who was the wisest man who ever lived, said to be even wiser than Dada and the other sons from Zara. Or if they were considerable men who set up great kingdoms themselves, it makes perfect sense. They would have been a good measuring stick to compare Solomon. And we see that both lines had kings, Pharez over Israel and Zara over Europe. And that is how the prophecy was fulfilled that there would be rulers forever 
from Judah because they were in Europe whilst the Israelites were with Moses in the Exodus. As the Israelites moved into the lands of Canaan, many become seafarers and generally they got called the Phoenicians. They were a confederation of maritime Israelite traders who set up outposts, seaports and even entire new colonies all across the Mediterranean. It's important to realize that they originated from the coasts of Israel, most notably from the cities Tyre and Sidon. Their most famous colony was Carthage, which was located on the northern coast of Africa. It was founded around the 9th century and it is most notably known for its conflicts with Rome, which were fought for dominance over the Mediterranean. But Carthage wasn't the only major colony, they colonized many of the islands and even reached as far west as Iberia, Spain, and then looping round further up north to Gaul, France, and even Albion, England, and Hibernia Island. Now modern historians outright lie and try to say that the Phoenicians were Canaanites, but they weren't. The Phoenicians only appeared after the Israelites invaded the lands of Canaan, and the Phoenicians were certainly Israelites from the northern coast of Israel, most notably from the seaport cities of Tyre and Sidon, both which were within the tribe of Asher's territory. Now most modern maps even try to claim that Phoenicia was some kind of separate Canaanite kingdom, region, apart from the Kingdom of Israel. Just do a simple Google search and many of the maps there you'll see maintain this lie, but it's all complete nonsense. Phoenicia is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Because so much of Europe was settled by Phoenicians, which makes it obvious that we are the Israelites, and furthermore that historical characters from Carthage, such as Hannibal the general who fought Rome, or the beautiful blonde Queen Dido who ruled Carthage, they were all clearly white, and this is why the lie on Phoenicia must be maintained. So they're trying to say that Europeans were Canaanites because Phoenicians were Canaanites, but that's nonsense, they were Israelites. So where does the name Phoenician and actually come from. It comes from a special purple dye from certain seashells and mollusks that are on the coast of Tyre. In Greek, phoinos means red purple, so phoinosian, purple people, which we transliterate to Phoenician. Now most Greek history, at least the history that has survived till today, is written by Athenians, by Athens, and they were a branch of those Ionian Greeks descended from Javan. To them, these Israelites were just Phoenicians. So most most Greek history is written from their perspective. They likely did not have full knowledge of the Israelite origin of the Phoenicians. Regardless, Phoenicians were Israelites and many of us today in Europe descend from these Phoenicians. This leads us onto the Dorians. The Danans were not the only invaders of Greece. A few generations after the Trojan War, the Dorians invaded. They would become the third major tribe in Greece after the Danans and the Ionians. From the Dorians, we get many city-states that later formed all over Greece and many sub-tribes, but the most famous Dorians were the Spartans and Macedonians. So think King Leonidas who led the 300 Spartans against the Persian invasion, and Alexander who conquered the entire Persian Empire. Yes, these were Israelites. Now modern historians try to claim that the Dorians came from the north. However, that is completely wrong. The Dorians came from the seaport Dor, which was within the territory of the tribe of Manasseh. Homer describes the Dorians as invading from the sea. Furthermore, he says they inhabited the island of Crete before they invaded Greece. And looking at maps, you can easily see how Crete would be the perfect in-between locations, a base of operations to gather strength for a full-scale invasion of Greece. Further historical proofs linking Dor to the Dorians are the many Greek artifacts that have been found by archaeologists in and around the location of Dor. Of course, the narrative is confused. These are not artifacts brought from Greece to Israel. Rather, these are Israelite artifacts. The Dorian Israelites brought their artistic culture with them to Greece and continued to develop it there. Further evidence is found in both the Book of Maccabees and the writings of Josephus. In them, there is a record of a letter written by a Spartan king or Lacedaemonian. Remember, these were Dorians. The letter is addressed to the high priest of Judea and this is around 160 BC. 
In it, he describes the Lacedaemonians as being of the same stock as the Judeans, both being derived from the kindred of Abraham. This is because they were both Israelites, both the same people. Lacedaemonian was a name interchangeably used for Spartan, but perhaps the biggest proof is Paul's epistle to the Corinthians. The city of Corinth was another Dorian city, so the same people and race as the Spartans and Macedonians. In his epistle, he tells them that our fathers were all under the cloud and had all passed through the sea. He's talking about the exodus with Moses where he led them through the Red Sea. That they ate the spiritual food, that's the manna that came down from heaven. That they drank from the rock that produced water, that's Christ in the desert. And this only makes sense if the Corinthians were Israelites, as well as all the Dorians, same race as the Corinthians. They were Israelites and that is what Paul is saying. So what about the Romans? who at one point ruled virtually all of the known world, where did they originate from? They originated from the Trojans. After the Trojan War and the sacking of Troy by the Dan and Greeks, one of the princes called Aeneas led a remnant of the Trojans on a voyage around the Mediterranean and eventually resettled in Italy. So Priam's son Paris had led Troy into total disaster and now a new prince Aeneas would start anew. The history of the founding of Rome and the origin from Aeneas is all confirmed by the historian Strabo who states that it is a fact. They set on the west coast, the region was called Latium and this is also why the later Roman language is called Latin. Aeneas married the daughter of the king of Latium and eventually became the king himself leaving a dynasty of kings, eventually leading to Romulus who 400 years after Aeneas founded Rome. Rome eventually got rid of the kings, formed a senate style government and became the Roman Republic and gradually began to conquer and absorb the surrounding city-states, eventually leading to the great Roman Empire we all know. So the Romans, like the Trojans, were the tribe of Judah. This is further proven in Paul's epistle where he identifies them as descendants of the Israelites. He tells them that they once knew Yahweh, but had become foolish, void of reasoning, thinking in they were wise, but now in fact fools. They had turned the incorruptible Yahweh into the resemblance of a man and birds and four-legged animals and reptiles. Firstly, how can the Romans have ever known the God of Israel? Yahweh only revealed himself to his people, the Israelites. The answer is because their Roman Israelite ancestors knew the truth, but over the centuries their descendants had corrupted the truth and began to worship idols. The Romans brought in all the false gods from all across the empire, creating a whole pantheon, including beasts and reptiles. On top of that, the Roman high god was Jove and was spelt with four vowels, I-O-U-E, and in Latin it was pronounced Yahweh. The later name Jupiter is simply a combination of Jove and Pater, which means father, so Jovepater together. Paul must have noticed this, but that's not all. Lastly, the prophecy of Daniel on Christ, his ministry, the crucifixion, and then Jerusalem being destroyed. Well, he said the people of the prince will be the ones to do that. Well, if you know history, you know it was the Romans who destroyed Jerusalem, and they are called the people of the prince, or people of Christ, because yet again, they were Israelites. So that covers the migrations to Europe, but what was happening in the East? Well, this brings us to the Parthians. They were most notable for their constant back and forth wars with the Romans. They were another nation who were Israelites. So as we've explained during the Assyrian deportations, Israelites were deported all across the Assyrian Empire. Now, one of those locations was called Parthia. The lands of Parthia were initially in poverty, but the Israelites gradually turned it all around. They were also extensively used as soldiers and mercenaries throughout the various empires. The Parthians, Scythians, Sake, all the same people were often considered the best troops of the various empires that ruled over them. So we should probably do a quick history recap here. The Assyrian Empire ruled over many provinces and roughly a century after the Israelite deportations, some of those provinces formed a secret alliance to overthrow Assyrian rule. Most 
notably the Babylonians, the Persians and dispersed Israelites. Their combined army marched on Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria and destroyed it causing the Assyrian Empire to collapse. Now this is where as we've explained in Proof 1, many Israelites now free began to migrate in waves to Europe. But they didn't all go. Some chose to just stay in the east. But with Assyria now toppled, this left a power vacuum. Who would now rule? The Babylonians seized power and formed an empire. But it didn't last long. Only a few decades later, the Persians overthrew them. And this is where we get the Persian Empire which lasted a few centuries. Then Alexander from Macedonia, Greece invaded and crushed the Persian Empire. But he died very suddenly and his empire was split up. Eventually one of his generals came to rule over the east. And this leads to the Seleucid Empire. So during during the period of all these empires under the Babylonian and Persian empires, Parthia remained under control. However, with the next empire, the Seleucids, Parthia began to rebel and the Seleucids struggled to keep control. Gradually, Parthia became independent and eventually rose to conquer most of the empire for itself. Now what's most fascinating is the kings of Parthia used the title Ar Sake. Ar in Hebrew means mountain, hilltop, high point. So together it means the highest of the Sake. Now as we've shown, many Sake were in Europe already and became the Germanic tribes. So they shared the same name because they were the same people. But that's not all in Josephus' writing. Now he wrote several books to the upper barbarians as he calls them, hoping that they would come to the aid of Judea in their wars with the Romans. And he identifies all of these people beyond the Euphrates, which were the lands of Parthia, as being the lost tribes, the deported Israelites or upper barbarians, and that they are an immense multitude, not to be estimated by numbers. In other words, the tribes and people in the Parthian Empire were the Israelites. So now if we put it all together, you may begin to see the whole picture. Firstly, the Israelites spread to Greece with the Danans, the Trojans and later the Dorians. With the Phoenicians from 1200 BC onwards, they spread to all the coasts over the Mediterranean. By 5600 BC, Israelites were spread into the north of Europe and it became dominated by the Germanic tribes. By 200 BC, the Parthian Empire rose up and had conquered most of the east. Then lastly, Rome gradually conquered most of Europe with its vast empire. So this means by the time of Christ, all of Europe or the Adamic world had become Israelites. Now was the perfect time to spread the gospel of Christ to his people. The apostles didn't go to the Gentiles, that's just a lie. They went to the nations of the lost tribes within Europe. Europe all accepted Christianity because they were the Israelites and many centuries later, the seed of Jacob did begin to spread all over the world from Europe, everywhere to America, Canada, all over South America and even Mexico and all the islands, spreading all over Africa, setting up colonies everywhere, to the furthest corners of the earth, Australia and New Zealand, but also reaching into the east, the Philippines, Indonesia, parts of China, India and gaining control of all the Middle East. There is nowhere in the world we haven't been. Only the Europeans can be the seed of Jacob. We are the Israelites of the Bible.